Good morning and welcome to church this morning. Do you want to stand with us as we begin our service today?
Lord, thank you that whatever weeks we've come from, wherever we're at in our lives with you, that you're there, that you're walking beside us, you're carrying us when you need, we need you. And Lord, I just pray that as we carry through the service that we would feel your presence, that you would meet us where we are at and that we would come to you open to meet you. In Jesus' name, amen. Morena, it's a fano, no my hide am I. Welcome to church this morning. Um, it's great to see everyone. Um, my name is Mel, and uh, you wouldn't have seen me last weekend because I was at Easter Camp and E Camp. Uh, it was pretty awesome. Um, Tim, can I actually get the video now? We have a video made by the amazing Gemma Wakely um, to give you guys an idea of what we got up to. Um, so, yeah. Um, so that was our camp. Um, there's lots more videos, lots more pictures that we took, um, but we had an amazing time. Thank you for your prayers. Um, we have some pictures from eCamp, hopefully coming up as well. There we go. So they're just going to flick through eCamp. I went out on Saturday and saw our young people and leaders, and it was such a cool environment. There were a 1,100 young people and leaders there, so that's like the most they've had in years. Um, so they played wide games, we did some screen printing, some of our young girls over the back, they have screen printed shirts on today, so go and ask them about that. I heard the music was really, really loud in the evenings, um, and there was like a mosh pit in the front. Um, but yeah, they had a great time, lots of activities they did at Finlay Park. Um, but yeah, I just really wanted to say thank you so much for your prayers and your support. Um, we definitely noticed how um, our young people interacted with one another, and that's because there was so much prayer going on behind the scenes. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we're gonna just quickly do some celebrations. Um, so I'd love it if you talked to the people beside you, around you. What did you celebrate this week? Um, and yeah, and then we'll get you to come up. Okay, if you celebrated something this week, we would love you to come and share um, about that. If not, I'll draw some of the Easter camp and E-campers up to share their 
highlight celebrations. All right, can you say your name and maybe if you were at East Camp or E Camp? Um, I'm Sarah, this is Vera, and that's Katie. And we went to E Camp and we're celebrating going to E Camp. Perfect, that's great. See, these girls have got their screen printed shirts on, they're going to model it as they walk back. Um, so they did that themselves. Um, very cool. Um, I went to E Camp and on the Easter Sunday I declared my life to God for the first time. That is so cool. Take, yeah, there we go. It's my birthday today. <laughs> so uh, I'm up here because um, we have somebody in the youth thing that didn't want to come up. It's, uh, Ev it was Evan's birthday four days ago. Yes, I had a birthday too. Wow, happy birthday. Uh, shout out to the E Camp and Easter Camp leaders. We survived! We did! There we go. I went to E Camp a year early. Yep, and what was your highlight? Canteen. The, can the canteen! Okay. I went to E Camp. My highlight was probably screen printing. Screen printing, yeah. Give us a twirl on your shirt for us. This is the, there we go. I went to e-camp and my highlight was biscuiting. Biscuiting, there was lots of biscuiting. Um, I went to Easter camp, but this is for today. Today's my parents' anniversary. Very cool, I think you need to take chocolate for them. There we go, awesome. Um, it's Sean's birthday La in the week. On the 4th? Yeah, it was the 4th, wasn't it? Okay, I'll give it to Karen. She's going to give it to you later. It's your birthday as well? Yes, take two. Oh my gosh, packing them in in a week. That is good. Um, no, hey, um, we've got a few notices to, to go through today. Uh, you might have noticed in the car park there were some cones and some like protecting thingies. We're just having a few uh, renovations to our lighting um, in the car park, which is amazing. Um, but please uh, just keep an eye on that. Obviously, don't park where the cones are. Um, and if you have any inquisitive young people um, who might want to go and look at them, please just be mindful and keep an eye out that they don't fall in any holes. Um, we have a time to seek tonight happening at 6 till 7 in the chapel. Um, so if you'd like to come along for an extended period of worship and prayer, um, we'd love to see you there. Um, can I have my models up, please? Models, models. Um, I've just got three models that are coming up quickly um, to mo <laughs> model. Yeah, good. I'll give you a chocolate for that. You can stand over. Yeah, look. You're not putting it on? Okay, um, as you know, we <laughs> um, talked about our values um, a few weeks ago, and we have you would have seen Scott modeling these shirts. We would love it if, as a church, we maybe got a few. Um, and so these are the three types of shirts that you could choose from. Um, they're all in different sizes, different colors. Um, can I get you to do a twirl? Woo, go on, Jack. Oh, okay, he's done a twirl. Um, but if you would like to show your expressions of interest in getting um, maybe you'd like one T-shirt or you'd like all three T-shirts, down the back, just in front of Mike in the sound desk, there is a table with uh, different sized T-shirts and a whole range of colors. And so you can uh, write your name, your number, and phone number, and then select a size and a color. And we need, I think, 50. We're not, we're not really sure, but we need quite a few to make it work. So this is a, if you'd like one, please let us know down the back. Can I get a round of applause for the models? You can take some time. <laughs> awesome. Um, so uh, our Jigsaw and Wonder Kids and Illuminates are happening today, but we are just going to uh, have a bit of a family time. So I'm gonna invite David and, David and Lynn. Um, and they're just going to share with us.
Hi family, we hope we can get through this. Um, Mike Waring used to be the youth pastor at OBC here, and 23 years ago today, he married our daughter Fiona, right here, right up here, here. And uh, five years ago, Fiona was diagnosed with cancer, and she's had a terrible five years. Um, but she prayed and said, Lord, would you give me five years so that I can see my kids grow up? And she had five years in one month. So God answered that prayer. Fiona died on Thursday of this last week, uh, just after midnight. We were, Lynn was there with her and so was Mike. And we've been looking after the kids for the last three months. Uh, mostly in New Plymouth. The funeral will be on Saturday, this coming Saturday, at North Point Baptist at one o'clock in the afternoon. And if any of you are traveling down, please just look at the Waka Kotahi website because there's lots of road closures. <coughs> We'd hate you to miss the funeral because you didn't calculate in uh, road stoppages. So just take a look at that if you're traveling. The funeral will be live streamed and I gather there's going to be people who'll meet here uh, to see it. Um, a couple of things where we saw the Lord at work. My sister Jeanette, who is a lot older than me, um, <clears throat> told me that she was woken to pray. And she, w she said, I was praying in tongues and I didn't know what I was praying, but she said I had this overwhelming sense of peace and joy. By the way, Fiona's second name is Joy. And, she's, and Jeanette has always been very close to Fiona. And she said, I didn't know what the prayer was, but she said, I had this amazing sense of the presence of God and a sense of peace and joy. And then she woke to my uh, communication to tell her that Fiona had died that night at that time. Two weeks before, a little under two weeks before Fiona died, we managed at the hospice to have a meal with her and uh, we got her down to the whanau room and we put her in the wheelchair and she very strongly said, I want to pray. The first time she prayed was for a family in, uh, associated with them that she had got alongside this woman her age and that woman had just died of cancer a few days before and left behind four children. Fiona prayed for that family and it was, it was like you were in heaven listening to prayer. It, we felt like she was more in heaven than on earth, the way she prayed. I've never heard her pray anything like that. And then the second time she said the same thing at another meal, just probably seven or eight days before she died. She said, I want to pray again. This was just before Easter. And she prayed for the kids going to Easter camp. And, and again, it was the most amazing prayer. And we, were just, we just felt like we were in this holy moment where she was leading us spiritually in something that was way beyond our comprehension. So for those things, we're grateful. Mike is left with three children and we want to be supportive of him. So you'll see us occasionally, and you'll see us when, you, we know, when we're not here, we won't be here because we'll be there. But um, Mike, on his wedding anniversary, has written this, and we just thought it was so powerful. We wanted you to hear it too. Before I read it, I, we just want to give our thanks to you as a family, as our church family, for the many prayers that you've prayed, the, the way you've cared for us and for Mike and Fiona and the family. It means the world to us. We feel like you've walked this journey with us and we, we thank you. This is what Mike has written this morning. It was supposed to be 23 years today. We were supposed to grow old together. There were meant to be so many more adventures. We were supposed to guide our kids through into adulthood together and watch them start families of their own. We were gonna be awesome grandparents and you were gonna be the coolest granny in town. But cancer changed all that. I know this isn't the end of the story, that we live in this space called the already but not yet. 
where there is this fantastic life in Christ Jesus, but also this terrible pain of a broken and hurting world. Jesus, I thank you that you were willing to come, willing to give up your life so that things will be different, so that death would no longer be the end of the story. Jesus, ultimately you will restore what is broken. There will be good news to the poor, the captives will be released, the blind will see, and the oppressed will be set free. But for the moment, we live in a world where we see the beauty and wonder of your kingdom, but also the agony of a world that is still broken. Jesus, we long for you to come again. However, we also thank you. Thank you that in the midst of our pain, you are here, that you will never leave or forsake us when we put our trust in you. Fiona, thank you for 23 years, which has shaped who I am today. Thank you for your love and dedication to our family, and thank you for the joy that you brought into our lives. I am also thankful that you are no longer in pain, no longer having to endure the hardships you faced. I am thankful that you are finally at peace, peace but you will be missed ever so much. Until I see you again, love you long time. Happy anniversary, my love. So that's, that's our son-in-law. We feel so blessed. We were blessed by Fiona. We feel blessed by Mike. And just please just keep praying, particularly for the children. Thank you. Um, we're going to spend a time in prayer. So if you'd like to come and surround David and Lynn, um, Campbell and Trina, do you want to come up or we can come to you? They're going to come up. So if you would like to come and surround these guys in prayer, um, we would just love to surround them with love and prayer. Loving God, so often it's hard to know what to pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for Fiona's testimony. Lord, we thank you for her witness to us, her faith in you. We thank you for the way that her words and her life inspire us still. Lord, we thank you for the way that you have walked with her. Lord, that you have walked with her and her family on this journey over these last five years. And Lord, we pray now for her family as they continue this journey, knowing that even though she is not with them, that she is with you. And Lord God, we thank you for that hope. God, we pray for, for the family now. Lord, for, for David and Lynn, for Campbell and Katrina, for, for Brooke and Lauren, for here in our midst. Be with them. For Mike and the kids at home. Oh God, carry them. May they know your embrace at this time. Reese 
we just pray that you would wreck them in the pub. We pray that as they grow up, they will tell the story of Fiona. And that her love and the spirit that was in her would fall on them. Father, we pray for the funeral on Saturday, that they would have a lasting impact on so many people who turn up. And Father, we pray that your story would be interweaved through that day and would fall on the ears and hearts that are ready to receive you. Father, I pray for strength for the family as they go through, not just the next week, but on into the weeks and months to come, that you would be present and close and the peace that surpasses understanding would rest on each one of them. Father, we prayed for assurance that you were there and that you were caring for the family at the end. And Lord, I want to thank you for the way that you revealed yourself over the last few weeks to the family. You gave them the assurance that you were in it with them. You were walking through this valley. And so I want to thank you, Lord, that there's that assurance that Fiona's in a much better place. No more pain, no more suffering. And Lord, you answered our prayers. We pray also for the future, that you will hold the family in your arms. You will surround the children with your protection and your blessing. And we really pray, Father, that you will have the victory, that your name will be honoured. And may this uh, funeral service be a real high point where your name is lifted high, you are honoured, and people will see that you are a God who cares. You are a God of love and compassion. And so we pray for all of those who will be taking part in that service, that they will be inspired by your spirit to share what you have on your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. Hey, um, we're going to send our young people and our children out now. Um, and you guys are going to head into a time of prayer and worship. Um, so if I can invite the band up. So Illuminates, Jigsaw, you guys can head out. we continue in our worship this morning. with my Fiona growing in my faith as youth leaders and I was choosing songs on Thursday while trying to process the loss of Fiona but all through her journey she's always been God is at the centre of this And in our grief, in our love for God, he's there with us. So as we worship this morning, do what you need to do. If you want to stand and sing, stand and sing. But know that God meets you where you're at.
that when we're weak, you are strong. Thank you when we don't see it, when we don't feel it, that you work and you never stop working. Lord, thank you that you walk beside us, you carry us. You're our guide, you're our light. And you do that day in, day out, without fail. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your consistency and your reliability. Lord, you're there and you see us. You see us in our joy. You see us in our pain. You see us in our highs. You see us in our lows. But one thing we know is you are the same yesterday today and forever. Amen. Please take a seat. just as we remain in this space of worship, we are going to gather around the Lord's table. Um, so um, if those who I've asked could um, distribute, I haven't actually asked anybody on this side, so I'm going to ask my girls, is that all right? Thanks. It's hard for them to say no. So I know um We've just come out of Easter, and so this story is very fresh for a lot of us, um, especially for me. Um, I've spent a lot of time um, looking at the Easter story over the last month. And yet the reality of the Easter story is something that gives us hope every day. As we gather together, as we um, spend this time together, we remember what Jesus did for us. We remember that he gave his life so that we could have life. That through Jesus' death, we know that death isn't the end of our story. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night that he knew he was going to be betrayed, he knew that one of those he was sitting with was going to hand him over. And that he would be falsely accused, falsely convicted. That he would be beaten. He would be whipped. He would be tortured. And he would be brutally murdered on that night. On that night. Yes, later he would focus on himself. But on that night, when he was together with his disciples, he turned his heart, his focus to them, to us. Because he knew that we were going to miss 
Jesus. That it was going to be tough without him there. And he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. And, and through this, through Jesus' death, through his body broken and his blood shed, he, he created a new covenant under which we now live. And he said, when you gather together, do this. Remember me. Remember me. Yes, remember the price that I paid, my body broken and my blood shed. But as we do that now, after Easter Sunday, we do it remembering that Jesus rose again that he was raised from the dead, and that as we remember Jesus, we remember the life that he gives and the hope that he promises us. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you went to the cross for us. We thank you that you took our place. Lord, we thank you for the demonstration of love that that is. We thank you for the powerful work that happened in the grave and that you rose again and that your resurrection power is alive and at work in us. Jesus, today, as we eat and drink, we remember what you have done. We, have remember, we remember your promise. We remember the hope we have in you. Jesus, today. We remember you. Amen. Let's eat and drink together. Right now, um, is very late in our service to be asking you the family time question, but that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to ask you um, this question, which is simply, what is something you have seen Jesus do? Um, and we talked a bit about this on the Easter Sunday for those who, who, who were here. It's a pretty similar question. So you can say the same answers again if you're not sitting next to the same people. But what's something you've seen Jesus do? And whether that was recently if you saw Jesus do something last week or at Easter camp or, or, or somewhere else, or whether it was a long time ago, and whether it was something dramatic, powerful, amazing, or something even just small, perhaps even a little whimsical. So um, just a few moments um, talking to the people next to you, if, if they're happy to do that. If, if you're feeling like a quiet moment, you can just reflect on this question by yourself. So just um, either chat or, or sit quietly and, and reflect on this question for a few minutes.
I'm actually going to ask another question later. So I'm, I'm going to get on with it. Am I there now? Can, can you hear me, Mike? Can you hear me, everybody else? Yep. So, I um, mean, you, you hear me telling stories about the stuff that, um, that I see Jesus doing f- fairly often. Um, and um, I was going to tell you a story about a, a dream I had this week. Um, but I might just hold that for another time. Okay, so you do, you, you, okay, you wanna, okay. Oh, look, it's, it's not a really big, it's not a really big thing. Um, well, it wasn't a big thing for me, but it still was a dream. Uh, so anyway, um, where do I start the story now that I'm, I'm gonna tell the story? So, okay, so um, who knows the Hope Project booklet things, the Hope Project, and yep, cool. And who's seen the ads on TV? Did you see the ads on TV this year? They were cool too. Who got a Hope Project booklet delivered to their house? Cool, awesome. Um, and who heard um, some whisperings of a little bit of controversy regarding the Hope Projects this year? A few people, okay. Um, so, so there were a few controversies and, and um, they're, they're, they're um, trying to figure out this. Oh, and so who knows that the guy who sort of heads up the Hope Project um, works in, in an office you can actually see from the auditorium. Yeah, so Dave is the guy's name. Anyway, I, um, I, I talked to Dave the week before Easter, and then um, the controversy broke out, and he sent an email, and the email said, oh, we stuffed up something, and we're gonna try and make it, we're trying to sort it out, we're trying to do the right thing, but we did do the wrong thing, and now we've gotta make it better, we're doing our best. Um, it was really, it was really well done. The email, it was kind of, kind of, um, I was really impressed with that. But I, I read the email. I thought, wow, that's really, that's tough, man. It's, uh, um, and I went home, and I kind of didn't really think a lot about it because um, we were getting ready for Easter camp and, and sending the kids away and a Good Friday service and and all of those other kind of things that were happening. Uh, and then. Um, and then, um, in the middle of the night, as you do, because that's when you're asleep, I had a dream. And in my dream, I was praying for Dave. So Dave, whose office is over there, and I was praying for him about where that chair is over there. I, I don't know why. I don't know why I was over there or why he was over there either in my dream. But we were in my dream together. And um, as I was dreaming, um, I prayed for him and I said, Uh, This is an attack from the enemy, but God is going to use it to open a door for effective ministry. Um, And and so that was my dream. And it turns out that in my dream, I'm much bolder to speak on God's behalf than I ordinarily am in real life. But then I thought I should actually share that dream with Dave because I felt like it was kind of not just something funny I ate, but actually that was God speaking. There we go. So that was God, Jesus doing something. I've just seen Jesus do something recently. Anyway, there we go. Today we're starting a new series, and our series is called A Story to Tell. And um, we're looking at the book of Acts. We're starting from the book of Acts, and um, which very handily for us just follows on from the Easter story, which we've all just participated in. And today's message is about being witnesses. And for anyone for whom that word might feel triggering, it's going to be okay. This is a safe space. But of course, it it might just be me. It might be, I might be the only one for whom um, the word witnesses is a little bit triggering. But when I was growing up, witnessing was mostly about going around with, with tracts about the four spiritual laws or, or something similar and trying to hand them to complete strangers so we could talk about it. And so to witness was to talk to people I didn't know about conceptual ideas that I didn't really understand. 
and uh, witnesses, or perhaps witnesses, um, were the people who did the witnessing. But the word witness is primarily a noun. Um, the, and a noun witness is not someone who witnesses to other people. Um, it's someone who has seen something happen. Um, just think about the term eyewitness. It's not eyewitness or the iPhone eyewitness, but eyewitness, you witnessed it with your eyes. Witness is it's not something we do. It's, it's something that we are. We are witnesses to the power of Jesus at work in our lives and in the lives of others. And being a witness is much more about what we have seen than what we say. We tell others of what we have seen Jesus do because we have witnessed it. Witnesses have seen Jesus at work. And the God that we have witnessed is worth telling others about. At the start of Acts, um, the author, Luke, um, talks about his first book, which, which we know as Luke's Gospel, and then the action follows hot on the heels of the resurrection account. Um, Luke says in Acts 1-3, During the 40 days after he, after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. I have so many questions um, about this verse. Uh, and the biggest ones I have are like, what was Jesus doing in between the time to time? It's kind of like, yep, Jesus turns up on, on Tuesday, and then he's gone until Friday, uh, and then he's back again on Monday. But what's he doing in between? And, and he talks about the kingdom of God, but what did Jesus say about the kingdom of God at that moment when actually the disciples are probably listening? Apparently all of those things are of very little concern to Luke. He, he skips over them. In the book of Acts, Jesus only speaks to these disciples, the, the 11, soon to be 12, but the, the, the OGs, uh, twice. He only talks to them twice. And so we're going to look at those. So Acts 1, 4 to 5 says, Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So the first thing that Jesus says is, Wait. Don't move on from here until you've received the gift that the Father has promised. Very shortly, Jesus is going to say something else. And if the disciples don't pay attention to this part, they're going to miss out on the most important aspect of what comes next. But waiting is annoying. Waiting can be frustrating. Waiting often feels like we're wasting our time until the next thing happens. Waiting carries with it an expectancy. You know, something is going to happen. We just aren't sure when. And, and when you don't know how long you're going to have to wait, it can be agonizing. Um, hands up anybody who might have either been overdue expecting a baby or had to live with someone who was over expecting, uh, expecting a baby. Yeah, there's a few hands there. That, like, okay, you had a due date and that's gone. And now you're just waiting for, pfft, don't know. That, that waiting. Oh, you, you know it's going to happen, but you don't know when. It can be agonizing. And so, and so Jesus makes it really clear. He says, don't rush off. Don't miss out on what I'm going to do right here. Stay here in Jerusalem until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And at this point, Jesus doesn't say what will happen after that. Though if you, you've read ahead, you'll know. And if, if you haven't read ahead, well, um, you'll get to find out over the next few weeks. Jesus tells the disciples to wait. Waiting is hard. Much harder than it sounds. A waiting exposes our powerlessness and our lack of control. 
and in, in Emma Thompson's movie adaptation of Sense and Sensibility, um, Marianne, she falls ill, and the doctor arrives, and the friends and family are left to wait through the night. And Colonel Brandon, there he is, um, he expresses all of our frustrations in waiting when he says, give me an occupation, Miss Dashwood, or I shall run mad. If you don't know the story, you'll have to watch it. Or you can ask me what, what happens, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, but you know, we want to do something that will help. We want to do something that will make it all better. We want to do something, anything, that might get us out of this mess, or at least make it look like we're trying. You know, look busy. But very often, Jesus tells us to wait. On, on Palm Sunday, two, two weeks ago, we talked about the crowds as they welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem. And I mentioned that for so many of the people there, there were hopes that Jesus was going to overthrow the Romans and usher in a new kingdom of Israel, our kingdom. We might imagine that Jesus' brutal death would have put paid to any of those notions, but apparently it didn't. So, when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? The apostles still think that Jesus is going to restore the kingdom of Israel. But as we noted two weeks ago, Jesus is never interested in being the figurehead of our kingdom. Yet the disciples are so certain that this is going to happen that they keep asking, when is it going to happen? It's like kids at Christmas asking, when can we open the presents? They know it's going to happen, and they're so filled with excitement about it happening that all they can think about is, when is it going to happen? When we are sure about what is going to happen next, we close ourselves off from all the possibilities of what else might happen. When we are certain about what God is about to do, it gets in the way of us seeing what God is actually doing. When are we opening the presents is the same sort of question as when are you going to free Israel and restore our kingdom? It presumes it's going to happen. But waiting can help us move on from our preconceptions and open us up to new possibilities. Acts 1, 7 and 8 says, He replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, Jesus' answer to their harping on question, when do we get to open the presents, uh, it has three parts. So there's the Father alone, but you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. And I'm going to touch on each of them, um, but I, I will focus on the last part a bit more because that's what the message is about, witnesses. But I do want to talk about the first two bits just quickly. So the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. Now this part, it feels like the sort of answers that I got as a child. Now I would get up in the morning, and I would ask my dad, can I have some breakfast? And he would say, all in due course. And as a five-year-old, I had no idea what the gorse having due on had to do with breakfast. As an adult, I now suspect that my dad thought he was saying, yes, soon. But as a child, I learned that all in due course meant no. I was a, all in due course meant you're not about to get breakfast. But Jesus is effectively saying, don't worry your pretty little heads about it. You don't really know what you're talking about. I've spent the last three years trying to explain it to you, and if you haven't figured it out by now, you're not going to understand it until it happens. Jesus, he isn't telling them off. He's, um, 
He's not upset that they're slow or stupid. He doesn't say, would you stop asking me such silly questions? You know, that's what, that's what I would do. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus knows that it will all make sense eventually. Just not right now. And so to the answer, to, to answer their question, Jesus gently, lovingly, simply says, not right now. You're just going to have to wait. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So Jesus moves on to say, there is something more important to talk about than our little kingdom. Even though you aren't getting the thing that you think you really want, you're going to get something that is actually so much better. It's what you need. Jesus has already told them to wait for this. When the Holy Spirit comes, they will receive the power of the living God alive and active in them. And this is what they will need to be able to do the thing that Jesus has for them to do. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This sentence is known as the Great Commission. And we talked about it during our Renew Together series last year. And I think Jesus puts it here after twice talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit and also after telling the disciples to wait so that they don't run off to do this without the Holy Spirit's aid. We all have a tendency to run off and do our own thing. We even try to do the thing that God has told us to do without God's help. I know it sounds crazy, and, and we all do it. Maybe you don't do it, but the rest of us, we all do it. You know, Jesus is like, I've got this thing for you to do, but hang on for a moment first. Just wait. And yet, the disciples' next job, uh, for the disciples, it feels very similar to one they'd done before. In Luke chapter 9, um, Jesus, it says, One day, Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all demons, to heal all diseases. And he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So they began their circuit of the villages, preaching the good news and healing the sick. So the disciples have already done a trip all around Galilee where they went to tell the people about Jesus and the kingdom and Jesus had given them the power to do it. And they'd done it and it went great. It was amazing. And so when Jesus gives them this new commission, the great one, it would very, be very, very tempting for the, the, the disciples to think, oh, Jesus has just got another road trip for us, just the same as the last one. And think, oh, sweet, same as last time. I've got this. Let's go. And they just charge off. But Jesus had told them to wait. For this role, they had to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. But I, I want to come back now to the phrase, you will be my witnesses. The disciples had seen Jesus. They'd lived with him, ate with him, watched him die, and saw him once he had risen again. They'd witnessed these events, and so now they were witnesses. And I think it's fair to say that Jesus' assumption is that once you witness the goodness of God through Jesus Christ, you will want to tell others. And the NLT, which we've just read, and at least 10 other English translations make this explicit. So the NLT adds, adds those lines, um, telling people about me everywhere. Which actually, it's implied, but it's not literally there. Um, I don't have time to go deep into this, but I think in addition to this sense of telling others, there's also a space in the text for Jesus to be saying that when we go, we will see Jesus at work. We will witness Jesus at work when we're in Jerusalem and when we're in Judea and when we're in Samaria and when we're in Greaton and when we're in Toriko 
and, and when we're at the mount and when we're here in Ultimate Time, we are witnesses when we see Jesus at work and the God we have witnessed is worth telling others about. Now, I think this naturally starts with the people we know. I'm not complete strangers. And once all the people we know also know Jesus, then it becomes time to meet new people. As a witness, I tell someone I know about something I've seen. And normally we tell others about something because we found it to be really, really helpful or really, really fun. Think about the things that you tell other people about. You know, we, we, we might be witnesses to a book we've read or a podcast we listen to. We might be a witness to a movie or a TV show we like. We might be a witness to an event that we've participated in or, or, we, or a restaurant we've eaten at. We might even um, be witness to a meme and share it with all our friends and followers. Not me, I don't really know how those work, but I know people who share them all the time. Um, if you don't know what they are, ask a young person. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's a little weird. You know, I find it so much easier to talk about the good doctor or atomic habits or park run uh, than to talk about the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who died and rose again, the one who is at work within me, transforming me and making me whole. But then I realize how much pressure I place upon myself when I read this verse, and the pressure just isn't there. Jesus doesn't say um, that we'll, we will be his converters or his persuaders, or his convincers. We aren't to be his naggers or his scaremongers. We are Jesus' witnesses. We tell others of what we have seen Jesus do. It's not our job to convict or condemn or moralize or lecture. The God we have witnessed is worth telling others about. We bear witness to the goodness of God in our lives and we trust that God will work in others as we tell our story of God's goodness. Jesus also doesn't say um, that it's some sort of race, some sort of competition to, to tell people about Jesus so I can get my witnessing quota in. Largely, for most of us, we can take our time and choose our moment to tell others of what Jesus has done. To begin with, we need to demonstrate real care, being present, asking questions, and really listening to people's answers. You know the saying they say, people don't care what you know until they know how much you care? This is really where it hits the road. You know, and in general, I'm not as good at this as I would like to be. Though I happen to live with someone who is absolutely amazing at it. She asks great questions. She listens so well. She remembers the answers. And she'll ask you again about it when you see her next. When I was at Vector, um, I'd play cards with several women from customer services at lunchtime. Um, the kids used to hassle me, actually, about playing cards at lunchtime with all the ladies. Um, and most of the time, the talk was pretty light banter. You know, we'd talk about all sorts of things. But every now and again, I would notice that a casual conversation would somehow cross over into a sacred space. And in that moment, we can, we can put pressure on ourselves to say the right thing or to present the gospel message in a convincing way, a come to Jesus sort of moment. But often that's not what's needed. In those moments, we need to actively wait on the Holy Spirit rather than rush on ahead. And sometimes we might tell others of what Christ has done for us in a similar situation. Other times they will simply know the difference that God has made in our lives by the way we act. So to make it clear, most of the people that I regularly came into contact with at, at Victor knew I was a Christian. So all the ladies playing cards knew I was a big Jesus geeky guy. And so sometimes I would share of God's goodness to what God had, had done. Um, sometimes I would even share um, from the Bible because 
for me, that was an important um, part of my life. Um, but the things I would share really weren't worth that much if I didn't live it. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit might prompt me to ask, can I pray with you? Um, and often in those moments, um, there would be tears, and, and then sometimes um, Sue would say, I, I go to work and make the girls all cry. But other times it would be a bit more low-key. I would just finish the conversation and say, look, I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying for you. Sometimes that was the word they needed to hear. The God we have witnessed is worth telling others about. Some of us have seen Jesus do amazing things. And so we tell others of those. And others of us have seen Jesus do some less amazing things, though they're still significant and they're worth telling others about. You know, if, if I'm going to take the trouble to tell you about the bakery that makes the really yummy chocolate brownie, I might as well also go to the trouble of telling you about the God who helped me find the last car park so I could buy the brownie and the God who prompted me to come and share the brownie with you. My witness is that God cares about every part of our lives, including all the mix of the weird and boring bits God made you to be you after all. God cares for everything that God has made. All of you. All the weird and boring bits. You know, for me, this role, this job that I get to do, to, I get to stand here and talk to you, this is something I look at and I say, God did this. God was slowly at work bringing us here. Sometimes even frustratingly slowly for me, which is saying something, because I am frustratingly slow for a lot of other people. You know, when we were praying for this job, we had a long list of things that we needed God to do for us, a very long list. And God provided every single thing on the list and, and gave us a few bonus things as well. This is what I am a witness to. We are witnesses to the goodness of God in our lives. Some of us may have only seen a little, a glimmer of hope that we cling to in the darkness. Others have seen the miraculous time and time again. Some have seen God in the fire. Some have seen God in the wind. Others in the earthquake. And some in the gentle whisper. But we are all witnesses to what we've seen God do. And the God we have witnessed is worth telling others about. You know, some of you might have heard people who have a testimony that goes like this. Before I found Jesus, and my life was a mess. I was on drugs. I dropped out of school. I hung out with the wrong people and I struggled with mental health and addiction and all sorts of other things. And then I found Jesus and everything is great and all my problems are solved and I don't have any issues. Hallelujah. And, and maybe... I know that sounds a little facetious, but, and maybe you have a testimony like that. And if you do, I thank God for it. But for most of us, our lived reality isn't like this. You know, last week, Phil shared with us an experience he'd had of heaven, which occurred during a time of pain and suffering. And this is the God that I know, one that meets us in our pain, sits with us in our grief, and provides a comforting presence. Sometimes God answers our prayers in miraculous ways. Sometimes God answers our prayers in seemingly trivial ways. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers. But God is still with us. And God is at work even in the midst of the mess. Even when we can't see God, God is at work working. Even when all we can do is wait. God is at work. And sooner or later, we will see God's hand at work. And the God we witness is worth telling others about. So as we finish, um, my final question is actually just a modification of the first one. It's this. Would you be prepared to share with us something you have seen Jesus do? 
whether that is recently or a long time ago, whether that is dram dramatic or powerful or mundane, or simple or whimsical. If you don't know what whimsical is, it's, it's one of those things where sometimes God speaks to you and he tells you off in a sort of joking way. And if you've never had that happen to you, it's okay. I've probably had that happen to me enough to make up for all of you who might not have. But would you be prepared? You know, the God that you have witnessed is worth telling others about. And we would love it if you started with us. So as we go through this series, A Story to Tell, I want to make time for us to hear what we have witnessed God do. This morning, that's why I didn't, I didn't ask you before, because one, we, we didn't have heaps of time, and because we'd already heard such an amazing story of what we had witnessed God do. Thanks, David. Thanks, Lynn, for sharing with us. But for everyone else, we want to hear from you. We need to hear what God has done and what God is doing. So um, if you've got something um, you would like to share, or if somebody told you a story and you think, oh man, they've got to share that, then either convince them to share that or just tell me and I'll make them do it. Or we'll, we'll figure something out. But we'd love to hear what God has done, what you've seen God do. Because the God we witness is worth telling others about. Let's pray. Jesus, when you rose again, your disciples, the ones who had lived with you, who had, who had heard your teaching, who had been mentored and discipled with you, still didn't understand what you were really all about. And Jesus, I, I want to thank you for that because it means that when I don't know what you're doing, it's okay, I'm in good company. But Jesus, I thank you that you are at work. Lord God, we thank you for the ways in which we have seen you work. Lord, I pray that you would give us boldness to share with one another and with those we know, to those around about us, those we meet, those we come into contact with about what we have seen you do. Jesus, we thank you that we have a story to tell, that the God we have witnessed is worth telling others about. God, I pray that as we go through this week, you would prompt us Give us those sacred moments, Lord, when maybe we just can be brave and share of your goodness in our lives. Amen. Amen. That concludes our service today. Thank you so much for your, for your time. Um, please um, stay for tea and coffee out in the foyer. Um, spend some time together um, and um, yes, if you've got something you want a, a story worth telling, please, please, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and there are some t-shirts on the back you can have a look at. Otherwise, have a wonderful week. God bless.